The very first thing that you need to do as an artist is assume you're going to be successful. Now, I'm not just saying that because it's like a mindset thing and you have to envision your success and you'll get there, blah, blah, blah. Sure, that's a part of it. But more importantly, you could end up in a really bad situation where you don't get paid your royalties or you could end up losing the rights to your music. And you could even find yourself in a situation where you owe someone a lot of money before you've even made any. There are numerous instances where artists have had a song take off and they didn't have the proper licenses and clearances and they ended up owing 200% royalties. 200%. What that means is, for example, let's say you have a hit song that earns $100,000. Well, if you owe 200%, that means not only do you not see a penny of that $100,000, you're on the hook for $200,000 that you now have to pay someone else. And if you don't have an extra $200,000 lying around, you're in a pretty bad situation. So for right now, let's forget about labels and promoters screwing you over. Let's first talk about how you can avoid screwing yourself. What's up guys, Justin here. And recently I hosted a couple live sessions with some music industry vets who share some super cool insights into how the music industry really works and what artists like yourself can do to navigate the industry and have success. Now, I'll share a link to a full recording of one of those sessions in the video description, which I highly recommend you go watch. We cover a lot of ground from what you need to do first to building a fan base to actually making money from your music. And we talk a lot about Web 3.0, NFTs, and the future of the music industry. So be sure to watch that. But first, I'm gonna share some clips from one of our conversations here so you can better understand why it's so important to assume you're gonna be successful and to make sure that you're prepared for success so you don't end up screwing yourself. One of the things that you can do as you're wrapping your mind around this is to really um, make sure that your back office is set up. Make sure that all of your paperwork is in order. Make sure that you, you that your, uh, your PRO is being an ASCAP BMIC sack here domestically is tight. Make sure your songwriter splits are tight. Make sure any agreements that you have are tight because um, when the money starts to come in and when you don't have your paperwork together, that's historically how artists get taken advantage of. And through what we're talking about with the Web3 technology and where it's headed, it, it's, it's a layer of protection. You know, nobody can come after your stuff because you've already got it set up once you begin to discover that you can do much of this yourself. So um, let us not forget about the importance behind that in anticipation and in association with Web3 and its, and its evolution. It doesn't really matter what level you are. You could be a little more advanced and have some momentum, or you could be very, very early on in, in this process. The things you need to do, this traditional music business, doesn't even matter. You need these things, even if you're going to make it over to whatever new advancements are coming or any of that stuff. You need to figure out what is your territory's performing rights organization. And in the U.S., it's BMI or ASCAP. I think up in Canada, it's SOCAN. In Germany, it's GEMA. There's different ones in different territories. You need to register your works with your local, <laughs> whatever territory you're in, where your music is originating from, in that PRO. You have to do that. If you don't, everything you do beyond that is for nothing, right? Because all of the stuff you're doing is so you can start to earn and all the little mechanisms and algorithms that you can assert yourself into, they all pay on a royalty system that, is paid through those PROs. And so the only way you get your money off of this stuff on that side of it, and, and you know, look, I tell artists all the time, assume you're going to be successful. Say one of your songs catches fire and yeah. a big movie company calls you up. So we're going to give you $100,000 to license your song. Are you prepared? Is your song registered? Can you provide them with the PRO information? Have you, have you sent in a copyright for your song? Have you protected yourself? Yeah. And so this foundational stuff, you know, again, in the, in the US, it's copyright.gov. 
you can get a it, it's it's a simple process do it do it it's worth it i know people tell you all the things that oh you can mail it to yourself and your computer has metadata on it and timestamps and you know, i've seen every single one of those arguments lose in court yeah because somebody else wasn't lazy and filed their copyright. So, you know, those registrations, those are really important, even though it seems like stupid, mundane, administrative stuff. Yeah. Very important. All right, so real quick before I share the next clip from another live session with Hakeem and Jerry, I'll just quickly recap two absolutely critical things that you need to do before releasing any music are to register with a performance rights organization in your territory. There are ASCAP and BMI in the United States. You only need to register with one, not both. If you live outside the US, you need to figure out what performance rights organization is in your area and register with them. You also need to register your copyrights. Doing these two things will not only protect you and your rights, but it will also ensure that you get paid all the royalties that you're owed, which is not going to happen just because you upload your music through a distributor, which is why most artists end up only getting paid a fraction of the royalties that they're supposed to be earning. That registration on your performing rights organization or society is where Spotify and Apple Music and all the YouTube, everybody, that's who they pay. They pay where, who the who is the track registered to, who are the rightful owners of the track in the performing rights organization, the performing rights society. That is where a lot of your royalties will go. So especially when you get into sync licensing and, you know, we did, I did the music placements for a film last year called 645. It's a psychological thriller film. Awesome. Placed all the tracks in it. Bunch of independent artists, all independent artists. I didn't use a single major in that thing. Um, and that got a theatrical release mid last year. And probably at the next distribution, those guys will start seeing some of the revenue from that. So it's important that you have that information there so they so know who they you get registering with a performance rights organization would be something you probably want to do before distributing music or oh anything. god yes yep before okay. before anything um and and listen and i'll say one more thing um that also does not equal a copyright neither does mailing it to yourself yeah <laughs> um you know there's where i i'm a frequent speaker for the copyright office um, I've been recognized both, you know, legally and professionally as an expert on copyright and IP in the music space. And I will tell you that there's a lot of myths out there, but there's really only one legitimate copyright process right now. And we're working to change that. I'm, I'm working with a few people and working with the copyright office to change that. But for now, copyright.gov, the instructions are very simple follow the instructions and make sure that you're actually doing your copyright. It's very important. You know, you got me giggling, Hakeem, because let me just add one last thing. Um, and yes, if, this, if, if, the, if the sample is three seconds or less, you still have to pay for it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Now it is one of the biggest myths, arguably, in the whole performing right publishing industry that I've ever heard of it throughout my career. Well, what if it's, you know, a couple of bars or less? Nope, nope, nope. Got to pay, got to pay, got to pay. Again, I mentioned this recently to another group. The operative word when it comes to things like that is identifiable. If it's identifiable, meaning good example, James Brown scream, you got to pay for it. Yeah, like, well, that was the uh, big hit Lil Nas X, Old Town Road, mm -hmm. that it was already blew up by the time they realized it had a uh, Nine Inch nail sample in it. Fortunately, Trent Reznor is really cool about that sort of stuff. So he was just like, go for it. But that could have been a big problem. That was one of those situations where he could have uh, ended up owing a lot of money. Well, you know, the, the classic example in, in the early years was um, Vanilla Ice sampling Queen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they were clueless. And that, yeah, under pressure. They were clueless. And they put that record out. And I don't remember how. how how, how successful that record was. 
I, I don't remember if it went number one or not, but it was a huge record. And obviously it was his biggest record ever. And he had to give it all back, just like Hakeem said a few minutes ago. So I'd like to, I'd like to point something out about your example. Sometimes what you see on the surface isn't necessarily how the business went. So if you look up Old Town Road, which I just did on Spotify, and you look at the song credits, they added Trent Reznor as a producer. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure on the back end, they offered him a settlement and added him to the split. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the business was still done, even though Trent Reznor was cool about it or it was settled quietly. Yeah. Um, there's often times where we see these things happen and then they quietly, they start to bubble up and then they quietly go away. Somebody got the bag and somebody was certainly compensated for their, for their creating. Yeah. All right, so after that conversation, I actually went back and did a little more research and discovered that Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross now own 50% of the publishing royalties of Old Town Road, which I don't have an exact figure on how much money that is, but considering it's one of the best selling singles of all time, I'm sure it's in the multiple millions of dollars at this point. So Lil Nas X went online, bought a beat for $30 that he thought he owned and ultimately had to pay several million dollars because it turns out that he was using someone else's music. Now, there are two things that you should take away from that. Number one, be careful when you're using samples. You need to make sure that you actually have the right to use the sample and that it's cleared properly. But also, number two, because Trent Reznor did the things that Hakeem and Jerry were talking about and registered his copyrights and registered his music with his PRO, he's now several million dollars richer. So assume you're gonna be successful and make sure that you take the time to do things properly. Register your copyrights and register with a PRO. I have another video here on the channel where I explain how copyrights and performance rights work in more detail, which I'll link to in the video description. And again, I'm also gonna to link to a full recording of one of the live sessions with Hakeem and Jerry that you just saw part of here. We get into a lot of other stuff beyond just copyrights and royalties. Hakeem shares a lot of insights into growing your fan base, where the music industry is heading with NFTs and Web 3.0. So do yourself a favor, Go watch that. You'll thank me later. You should also follow Hakeem Draper on Clubhouse. He shares a ton of valuable insights into the music industry and the music business. Red Pill Sessions every Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. I'll link to his Clubhouse profile in the video description below so you can go follow him there. And I'm going to be hosting more live sessions with Hakeem and Jerry. So if you have any questions, please be sure to leave those in the comment section here. Give the video a thumbs up if you found it helpful and be sure to subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. Tick the little bell icon to be notified as soon as new videos like this one are released here on the channel. And again, do yourself a massive favor if you're serious about a career in the music industry, check out the full replay of one of my previous live sessions with Hakeem and Jerry in the video description and get details on how to register for the next live session that we do so you can get some real insights about how the music industry really works and get your questions answered in real time. In the meantime, I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.